So how did you show up with grace? You said that he offered a level of grace, that he was built for you. So what are some of the obstacles that y'all had to overcome that y'all's grace, y'all's commitment to one another allowed y'all to weather the storm? One thing came up for me right away, and is that I was a runner. She's a runner, she's a track, track star. star. That was me, okay? I didn't like confrontation. I, I couldn't handle it. I wasn't taught how to handle it. You know, we did premarital uh, counseling, which, you know, it was good and it wasn't. They didn't really prepare you, but it, it helped, right? Um, I remember very clearly we were having a disagreement and I was like, I'm out. She's got my stuff. And you was said leaving. out, were you out of the marriage? Just trying to get out of the house. Okay. Just trying to get out of the house. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. What and, year? What year? How many years were y'all married? This, um, this was very early. One, like one, maybe one. And he gripped me. He literally... Hang on. <laughs> take it easy. <laughs> Hang on. I had a vision to take the Dear Future Wifey podcast on the road. You ask? We're delivering. I'm traveling to your cities to curate healing conversations across the globe. I'm Lateris R. Whitfield, and this is Dear Future Wifey on tour. Let's give him a Bermuda welcome. The one, the only, Lateris Whitfield. Let's give it to him. Let's do it like we do it in Bermuda. This is the man. Bermuda, what's going on? We in this thing right now. Listen, I am so excited to be in your beautiful country. Ah, it's raining and all that good stuff. I was hoping I was gonna be able to sit on the beach or something, but I'm sitting in my hotel room, resting. Just looking at the rain. It's been amazing, it's been amazing. Listen, shout out to Charmaine and her amazing husband. Women of living water, such an amazing thing. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. I'm your host, Latera R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. We are in the amazing country of Bermuda. Bermuda, stand up, what's up? Represent in the building. Listen, this place is absolutely breathtaking, absolutely beautiful. Um, I realize y'all drive on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> or either we drive on the wrong side of the road. I haven't figured out which one yet. And I've noticed that y'all have churches every five steps. <laughs> every five steps. I'm like, there's a church, there's a church. I'm like, wow, if y'all come together, y'all have a big old mega church, but y'all, what's the average attendees of y'all churches? It's like about 150 or what is it? Some of y'all, what, got churches with six members? <laughs> y'all need to go and join the church next door to y'all because it's, it's a whole lot of churches. Y'all can save money. Well, listen, I have an amazing, uh, we're going to do a two-part uh, episode today. The first episode will be with some married folks. How many of y'all are married out in the audience? Yeah, yeah, y'all sound a little weak right there. Y'all like, eh. some of y'all on the fence right now. Y'all contemplating divorce or something because y'all, the way y'all clap, y'all like, after tonight, I don't know. We may change our mind. Well, I want y'all to welcome to the stage my people, Antonia and Lloyd Holder, and Franzia and Dr. Wayne Swan. Let the women sit on the inside. Women on the inside, guys on the outside. Perfect. All righty. So listen, I was told that, well, with a lot of smaller islands, people are a little private. And uh, it's like uh, my boy uh, Lloyd said, it's not six degrees of separation. It's like half a degree of separation. <laughs> so everybody knows somebody. You either went to school with them, went to school today with their brother, go to church with them, or something, work with them. And so uh, I like to commend them for being bold and to be transparent, to share uh, stuff that y'all may be shocked. You know, I don't know what's gonna come out during this episode, but um, transparency is something that we thrive in. The Bible says that people will overcome by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the lamb. 
So the reason why a lot of us can't get set free is because we're holding on to our testimonies. How many of y'all believe that? It's, it's, it's in your testimony that gives people freedom. Do y'all, do y'all, did y'all ever have testimony service in church? I know a lot of times, uh, I used to love that a lot because you'll see people stand up there and they'll be like, well, first giving honor to God and, and they'll begin to acknowledge everybody and then they'll start telling their testimony. They'll be like, my car broke down on the way to church. My, I just got evicted out of my home. My son went to jail for the third time. My husband left me. He's an alcoholic. And they'll name all this bad stuff and they'll say, but God is good. And I'm like, God is good? I don't know what kind of God you serve. They don't sound too good to me. But what was so great about it is that they'll begin to share all the stuff that they're going through. And at the end of it, you'll go, hey, if mother so-and-so could stand up there and share about all the bad stuff but still has a smile on her face, then what I'm going through right now can't take me out. And so that's what I love about this, the, the, the Dear Future Wifey podcast is it's a platform to show people that um, though we're all on this earth together going through our individual struggles, that one thing we have in common is hope. And we all want to experience love. How many single people are in the audience? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. It's testimony time. Yeah. Yeah. Sound a whole lot better than the married folks. Mary, woo! The married folks like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 I guess so. But listen, that's what we're going to do. We're going to unpack some things. So uh, before we get started, give my panelists a round of applause for their boldness and transparency. And what's so cool about old Dr. Wayne... Dr. Wayne Swan is that he's used to being on the other side where he's giving advice and hearing other people's testimonies. And so it's great. It's a great honor to have you up here uh, and share your own testimony. So it's going to be amazing. What I like to start off with is asking the fellas, because for all the single people, you always want to know, why did you choose this particular woman to marry? And what happens is, you know, as single people, you'll look at it, you'll find yourself dating these particular guys, and then y'all break up six months later, they're married to somebody else. And you go, I was with this joker for six years and he never even offered me a ring and then he marries this other person six months later. How many of y'all <laughs> have experienced that before? Have y'all experienced Look at her, she clapping her hands, she's mad right now. You had a flashback, you had a flashback. Dr. Dr. Swan, you're gonna need to talk to her. Talk to her at the end, that's your next patient. But listen, and that's what happened. So I always love asking brothers, Lloyd, what made you marry the beautiful Antonia? No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> what made me marry Antonia? Um, it's going to sound strange, but I was actually away. I was in Miami on a boy's trip. You know, it's on a boy's trip, right? <laughs> Doing boy's trip things. Well, ordinarily. I would have probably been doing boy strip things, but I think on this particular occasion, I was at the house, we're getting ready to go out, and Antonia called me and was telling me she's getting ready to go to church. And this was new because she didn't really go to church. And for her to say she's gonna be, she's getting ready, she's actually asking me for one of my closest friend's number, telephone number, so she can meet him and he can take her to church. I was like, what? <laughs> but I trust him. I trust him. I trust him. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I just remember hanging up the phone, turning around to my friends that were, that were all out there with me, and I said, yep, well, that's it. <laughs> what? What made it it? Because she was going to church? <laughs> I, I think, I think it was... Was she a heathen at first or something? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, not a heathen, but you know. <laughs> we, we, we didn't go to church regularly. We were, not, we were not that focused in that particular area at, at all the time. And I think, you know, obviously I've been, I've been born and raised in the church and it's, it's in you, right? You have certain values and it was something that, it was just something, the fact that it was not a pressure scenario. I never once pressured her and asked her to come or or join any particular denomination or do anything. It was just a, a pressure-free decision that she made that ultimately resonated with me and it made me feel that it was possible for us to be able to move forward together. So. That's deep. Normally you don't hear a lot of men talk about the, the faith aspect of a woman, but that was important for you. It's for her to be a believer, for somebody to be solid in Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're about to chime in. What are you about to say, Antonio? Well, he recovered quite nicely, so I don't think I need to chime in anymore. 
<laughs> One thing that he did say to me uh, when he shared that story the first time, he was like, you were really bold to ask one of my friends if they would accompany you to church because we're Adventist and I didn't know anyone at church, but I wanted to be in his house. And so we, Lloyd and I had been going together and I didn't have any friends in the church. So I did the next best thing and I asked one of his very best friends and we went. How I many men could handle that? I don't, can y'all handle this? your girl saying, I'm gonna go to church with your, with your best friend? <laughs> Lord, real secure, huh? Because that could have worked out a whole different way, Lord. Could have worked out a whole different way. Uh, Dr. Wayne, what made you marry Franzia? Well, to be very transparent, and I don't have a problem with being that, um, God has delivered me from people, so I don't have a problem with that at all. How many of y'all know that Jonathan McReynolds song, People? So that's what that reminds me of. It's a beautiful song by Jonathan Mac Reynolds called People. And he said, deliver me from people. Uh, deliver me from people's opinion. That's the only way you can ever walk in transparency and vulnerability if you get delivered from the thoughts of people. God told me that in 20, 20, no, 2008. He said, if I can deliver you from the opinions of people, I could finally use you. And when he said that, I said, but God, I need people to approve of me. I mean, why wouldn't we want people to approve of us? And God said, if you begin to walk the walk that I want you to walk, yes, people are not going to approve of you. Yes, and so that's when you decide, choose ye today who you will serve. Yes. And so it has to become a line in the sand when you decide to live for Christ and tell everybody else, you know what? For Christ, I live. For Christ, I die. So let me talk to you, Dr. Wayne. So what happened? So after... Um two failed marriages, um, I decided to do some self-work. Hold the microphone close to your mouth as possible. You said two failed marriages. <laughs> two. I want them to hear you in the back. Yeah. <laughs> you a whole therapist, you have two <laughs> failed marriages. So, so I, I was a slow learner, who knew? <laughs> I, I, was, I was the last one to know. <laughs> but that, after the first failed marriage, um, I realized that, uh, yeah, I was the problem. <laughs> but what I also realized that she had problems too. We, we married because of love. I learned, and you need to write this down because this is important. I learned that love does not keep a marriage together. Unpack that. Why? Because with love, there are expectations. If you ask someone, do you love me? Listen carefully their explanation as to why they love. Because if they say, I love you, when? Mm. Mm. If I, I love you, when you do a certain thing? What happens when you no longer do that? Yeah. I love you, I love your hair. What happens if I lose my hair? Yeah. So if I tie with love, the why, ladies run. If you can describe why you love a person, you immediately put expectations, and most, if not all, relationships fail because of failed expectations. And that's what happened to me. And I think with the silence that there's some of it that's thinking too. <laughs> I learned that love really doesn't have a reason. Yeah. Love, love, love doesn't have a reason because, um, well, God said it best. He, he commanded his love towards us in that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. He said, so, that was his meaning. He said, I love you so 
He died for us before we, had a pro before we were born. We didn't do anything. So God's pattern was that I love you no matter what. And, and interestingly enough, that is the love he calls us as men to have for our wives. Because he never commanded women to love their husbands. He said, man, love your wives as I love my wife, the church. And I loved her. I gave myself for her. But he did tell the women to respect your husbands. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I, I want, once I understood that, really, Hold really the microphone so. closer. I'll, I'll make sure y'all hold the microphone as close to your mouth as possible so when I post it, I, we can hear you. So when I did my self-work on that, I understood my why and did my homework on me, on Wayne, looking at the man in the mirror and asking those questions to get to know who Wayne was. Why did I fail? What, what caused me to do those things so that I didn't repeat it? Right. Um, so fast forward, I wasn't looking. I was doing my doctor, doing my homework, all those things, keeping busy, waiting on God to do some things. And while I was learning and maturing, a uh, certain lady who I was um, friends with, i.e. Francia, um, I never saw her in the light of a partner or girlfriend. She was cool to hang out with and so forth. Something intrigued about her, that same look she has on her face right now, the poker <laughs> face. <coughs> she, it was mysterious to me. Um, and then life went on and until one day, I saw her and I said, wow, where, where you been? But she's been there all along and we got to know one another and uh, in the, from the standpoint of really doing the deep dives first. Now, do we know everything about one another right now today? Absolutely not. But we married because we married on a, uh, an informed decision because we had knowledge of one another. And uh, the Word of God talks about there's three things for successful marriage. There's, there's wisdom, understanding. There's knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge is information. Understanding is comprehension of that information. And then wisdom is action. And if we ever get those three together, I think we'll have more healthy relationships. Good, good. That was a long response of asking her why you decide to marry her. Now I'm curious about how you ask her to marry you and how many days did it take for you to he did, propose. He did not propose. He didn't me. propose. He did not propose. What did he do? How did he do it? He just said, he just handed you a ring and said, put it on. What do, you, what do you do, Francia? So, this particular day, he says he proposed to me. It was raining, and he asked for a ride to work. And we're driving in traffic, and I'm driving. And so when I look, he says something about, oh, I'm just letting you know that my intentions are to be married. I'm not a, a dating guy. And I'm like, okay, I'm not getting married. <laughs> just like that. So I'm thinking it's a conversation, <laughs> driving into Hamilton, like any other conversation. Later on, I think it was after we got married, Don't he tell, I have Don't look to. at me, you're telling the story. So when I look, he says, I did propose to you. Remember that day when we was driving into town? And I was like, that is not a proposal. And this one's very creative. So I'm waiting for this creative, elaborate, special something it's my first marriage can you please give me a proposal i'm still waiting i'm still asking for the proposal five years later i still want my proposal go ahead there it is no go ahead look at him. we couldn't even go through with that look at him. 
So you tell me, so how did, how did it transition from just this friendship to marriage? He just said, meet me at the altar in your white dress. <laughs> I'm gonna try and keep it short. We have a very interesting story, but I'm gonna keep it as short as possible. Hi, I think we should get married. Well, I need a plan. How much is it gonna cost? I'm a maximizer. How much is it gonna cost? Where to, how many? What does that look like? So I'm like, we're gonna go overseas, we're gonna invite everybody. Expensive. So let's just say this was 2017? 2017, 20, 2017. Oh, I remember we got married. And so I'm like, Okay, I'm thinking about it. We never set a date. We never set a year, but I'm thinking like four, five, six years maybe after this conversation. Really? You, you were willing to wait that Listen, long? See, women, that ain't grip their spirit right there. I feel, I'm they just said, saying, we ain't gonna sit around for no six I'm, years. I'm a type, my thing about marriage and or children, I've been single for a very long time. So, so you were happily single? I was okay with being single. If it happened, it happened. If it didn't, it didn't. That's always been my philosophy for marriage or children. So I wasn't feeling that I had to be pressured and I was enjoying, but at the same time, like, is there something missing? But the way things were happening, I was caring for my parents and I was busy, so I didn't have to. So he knew that this was gonna be a little bit of, well, I'm gonna say a little bit harder because I told him already, I don't know if I'll be one to get married. So he knew that. So to that point, I'm looking and planning and looking at the options, and I think he tricked me into it. So <laughs> he was like, let's go and look at the venues, let's go. So I'm literally going to people and talking to wedding planners, and they're asking me questions, and I'm like, it's gonna be on Skype, I don't know how many people, 20 people, I was making up stuff, because I just wanted a budget. That's it, so then I can determine, maybe five, six years later. So we go and we're looking around and then he says, oh, let's look at a location because we wasn't too sure. When we walked around that location, he fell in love with it. The lady's like, oh, what date? I said, I told you already, I'm just looking. looking. I'm not, I have no dates. I'm making stuff up. Between him and the planner, they came up with a date. <laughs> it's literally right. I am intentional. And when I looked, we had a date, and the unfortunate thing is, it was just us and our, our maid of honor and best man, that's it. Because we decided that that was the best thing because he has a big family, and it was just interesting. So what year was again, that? What I year, 2017? No, we got married 2018. 2018. So when I say a roller coaster of, I'm thinking I'm exploring, and then when I look, the date shows up. <laughs> We're married. It's been five years. <laughs> that is absolutely hilarious and sad at the same time. <laughs> So much more too, but we don't have all Oh, God, I don't think I can handle the rest of it. I'll be sad. Antonia, there's a question that a man always asks, will you marry me? We always talk about the man proposing, but a woman has to accept. And we've seen this oftentimes on social media videos where a man may um, be asking the woman and hasn't done a trial close. I was in sales all my life, and what what we've done is it's a method called trial closing where you know that they're going to say yes or you lead them with some trial closes before you ask for the actual buy-in. And so what, after he proposed, well, did he propose to you? Did he, did he actually propose to you? Absolutely, okay, he did. Okay, okay. He flew me to Paris to propose. Woo! Lord, what's up, Lord? Lord, look at you. Look at you. So go ahead, tell me about this proposal and what made you say yes? Lloyd, uh, talk to him off. <laughs> said, talk to your homie. I truly believe that I had already made up my mind before we had went on that particular trip. I wasn't expecting it because it was cleverly masked. 
uh, so that it could remain a surprise. Um, and so I just remember when he asked, I paused for a really long time. I just think I might have been in shock still that it was happening. And then he was like, so are you going to tell me yes? <laughs> and I said yes. Um, but if I'm honest, whether it was in Paris or Bermuda, I would have said yes. Um, we have been dating for two and a half years. We talked about it. Um, we knew that we wanted to be in a committed relationship. We knew already by that point we had loved each other. And my definition of, of love has changed significantly since that day. Um, and yeah, it, I think I just, I knew. So, so you said y'all were dating for two and a half years. Yes. Did you have like a shot clock? Did you, ha did you say like if he doesn't propose by this long, then you will walk away from the relationship? No. I, I never pressured him and he never pressured me. Um, did you have any friends and family members that try to bring pressure to be like, what are y'all doing? Y'all get married or what? Yes, but nothing is really coming to mind. It's just one of those things where you see someone dating for a long time and they say, oh, when are you guys getting married? Yeah. And then you're married and they say, oh, it's been a year and a half. When the baby's coming? And you say, can I just you know, be happy with my marriage for a little bit? Then the first baby comes and they say, you got to have another one. You know, it, it was sort of just like And that's that. why I say it's so important to get delivered from people's opinion. Yeah. Because them people ain't going to help raise those kids. <laughs> Them people ain't going, you know, it's like we, we're making decisions based on other people's expectations, which was talking about expectations. And so that's one of the things that I commend y'all on is not to be, is that y'all didn't become a slave to other people's expectations on how y'all got at y'all's own relationship. Um, at what point did you know that you were going to marry her? Yeah, I'm talking to you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I said when I went on the boys trip, we... It was when I had that, that realization. But how long between that moment and the trip? The, the trip to actually yeah, propose? Yeah, to actually propose. I think things happened fairly quickly from then. I think the trip would have been maybe five or six months later at the most. Because um, I just, I took time to kind of think about how I wanted to, to propose and you know, how we can make it special and went back and forth thinking around it. Do I really want to do this? And of course, you got to go and try and find a ring and all the other things that come along with making that decision. So about six months. So when you say, did I really want to do this? Uh, unpack that. What do you mean by that? Well, I think the reality is that my reality, I can speak for me, is that uh, you see people in marriages, you see relationships, knowing people that have been in lengthy relationships, you can even look at your own friends and family members. Some people are happily married, some people are not. Um, and one of my fears was like to be in a relationship where I'm like, what did I do? Who is this person? And having spoken to the elders and other people, they would say to you, you don't really know your wife, you know. The, you don't know until, until the ink's dry. That's what they'll say, until the ink is dry, then you find out who you really married. And, you know, so I had, all of those thoughts, like, should I be doing this now? You know, I think I was 35 at the time when I got married. I was like, is it, am I ready? Have I got all of my play out? You know, did I see the world? You know, whatever it was. And so those things kind of was, was whirling through my mind at the time to say, is, and I think she, she was a little bit younger, so it was like, is she ready? You know, do I, do I want to, do we, should we do this now? Or just because we think we love each other, do we need to get married? You know, so we started to go through all those various um, thoughts. I want to ask the brothers this. We always talk about, he made a mention about getting all of our play out. Do you feel like that's something that has to take place? Like, is that, can you just go in, I'm going to talk how I talk, smash enough women to get to the point where you say, now it's time to get married? Like, what, what, what is that about men? Like, is it, is it something that you made a comment? Is it it's, some threshold? No, I would say not all men are in the same boat, but I think that the people that I knew and maybe I've had associated with, I knew that enough to know that it's important for, for a man to explore certain areas of his self, you know, who he is. I always make the, the, the comment that a 17-year-old, say, let's use from the age of 17. This is my little analogy of it. Yeah. 
From 17, I see the average young man is out there living his life, doing his thing. And he's gonna, by the time his, I said I got married at 35, so let's say 17 years later, you're not the same person that you were when you were 17. Of course not. And there are gonna be lots of different things that you like. I used to like blue a lot. Now I like light blue. <laughs> you know, I used to like, but red's great. And pink's pretty cool too. And you start to want to, you know, and, they're, and they're all part of you, they're all iterations of, of you at various stages in your life and in your development, what you've seen and what you've been exposed to. And so I'm not advocating for a man to go sow his royal oats. Yeah, and especially not in a reckless way, yeah. um, nor a woman. But I am saying that it's important for you to get to know yourself before you can be any good to any woman. Absolutely. And, and I think. Sometimes, as a part of that journey, you may go through those physical encounters. Right, makes sense. I actually equally agree with you in that it's important for a woman to get to know herself as much as possible. Um, you know, one of the things that I've had to go through on my maturity, le maturity level is, you know, I never lived on my own. I never had the opportunity when I was in university, but I mean, coming back home, getting settled, being in the workforce, you know, buying my own car. I did have a bike, but you know, I always wanted to get my own car. I moved, you know, out of my dad's place, and Lloyd and I were already proposed, and we moved in together. So I evolved during my marriage, which was not easy. Not easy for me, not easy for him, because when you say, I do, you don't go into it saying, I'm gonna change, right? right? You don't, right. you're not, I wasn't aware, like in 11 years, I will be at this level. Um, and so, you know, when Lloyd was asking the question to himself, like, am I ready for this? I think I also asked the question, am I ready for this? But I didn't know it as I know it today. I, I think that if I was in a different place, excuse me, if I was in a different place, I would have been able to show up in a different way in my marriage. But because our God does nothing by mistake, the level of maturity that I was able to go through was meant to be with my husband because he was built to be the one to help me to get to that point. That's good, that's good. I think that we uh, don't give each other enough grace through the different stages that we go through. Um, and I'm going to ask both of y'all these questions. So how did you show up with grace? You said that he offered a level of grace, that he was built for you. So what are some of the obstacles that y'all had to overcome that y'all's grace, y'all's commitment to one another allowed y'all to weather the storm? One thing came up for me right away, and is that I was a runner. She's a runner, she's a track, track star. star. That was me, okay? I didn't like confrontation. I, I couldn't handle it. I wasn't taught how to handle it. You know, we did premarital uh, counseling, which, you know, it was good and it wasn't. They didn't really prepare you, but it, it helped, right? Um, I remember very clearly we were having a disagreement and I was like, I'm out. She's got my stuff. When you said out, were you out of the marriage? Just trying to get out of the house. Okay. Just trying to get out of the house. Like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. What and, year? What year? How many years were y'all married this um, This was very early. One, like one, maybe one. And he gripped me. He literally... Hang on. <laughs> Take it easy. Hang on. Let, we're gonna I'll edit. be clear. We're gonna, I'll be clear. I'll gonna, be clear. We're going to edit that part. <laughs> No, but ladies, honestly, if, like, if you could imagine where you're just angry and you try to run for the door and your hand gracefully goes back like this and the music is playing in the background and you just want your man to grab you, that's what happened. You know, he, he just grabbed me. <laughs> but it was the grab. It was the grab. No, honestly, it was, it was the grab that grounded me. Because if not, I would have been gone and I wouldn't have dealt with it. And then I started to develop, I think it would be courage, a little bit more courage to confront whatever would have come, whether I liked it or not. 
The Grab Grounded Her. <laughs> is the name of the new book. Make sure you go out in the lobby called The Grab Grounded Her. That's powerful. What made you grab her and say, I'm not gonna let you go? Um, I think because of my upbringing. And I think because of what I've seen, the men and the women in my life that have shaped me. Um, and I am from a family of, we, we address, we hit issues head on. Um, you come to my house on a, on a weekend, on a, on a family lunch or something, be prepared. <laughs> be prepared. You have a viewpoint, say it. Yeah. And be prepared for somebody to tell you that's the dumbest thing they've ever heard. <laughs> and, true. And, and not get your feelings hurt. And so I know I'm not the only one who's come up in that kind of a household. So, so for me, I was, exp I was used to women who were willing to stand their ground and say, no, 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 I don't agree, and here's why. Um, so for her to kind of want to run, it was like, no, no, but that's not what we do. <laughs> that's not what we do. And I, I think I might have probably even said that. That's not what we do. That's, in this house, we're going to talk it out. It might be a tough conversation. It might mean somebody shed some tears. Um, it might mean a quiet night. <laughs> it <laughs> might mean a quiet night. <laughs> Lonely relations, but, <laughs> but, but on the back end of it, you know, you can, at the end of it, you've dealt with it. You've, you've seen it, you've hurt, you've cried, you've grown, you, you've dealt with it. And, and you find yourself growing, you know, as various scenarios come up in your life, personal life, as a relation, your relationships, you start to be, grow that, get that confidence to, to, to meet issues head on. And also, he's absolutely right, so conversely, I didn't have that as an example in my household. We didn't talk. Um, just a bit of context, I was raised by a single father. My mom passed away when I was 12 and I have two older brothers. Uh, and so, you know, my dad, who is wonderful, I love him to death and we are so close today, he did the best that he could do. But he was also not taught to confront his issues or also be um, open with his feelings. So in turn, I didn't get that modeled for me and I wasn't able to, to sort of give it. And that's what a lot of therapy taught me because I, I believe in therapy and theology. I believe in you know, praying and also talking to someone. And you know, during that journey, we were able to unpack our generational dispositions. Mm. And that is really what, you know, has kept us going and the commitment we have to each other. That's good. That is absolutely good. The swans. <laughs> I don't know where this is gonna go. <laughs> Heavenly Father help us. What were some obstacles that y'all had to overcome uh, besides y'all's proposal or none proposal, <laughs> what were some obstacles y'all had to overcome in y'all's marriage? So, uh, very similar to uh, you two, um, there's almost a carbon copy, really. I'm, I'm the fixer, sometimes to my demise, but that's who I am. You, you can come to me and say, you know, uh, I have this issue, whatever the case may be. I immediately am thinking in my, how can I help? How can I fix this thing? You haven't asked me for that. So into our marriage now, I'm not only the fixer, I am the peacemaker. She's the peacekeeper. I, I how long you gotta break that down? That's just <laughs> my spirit. You're the peacemaker and she's the peacekeeper. Explain. I'm the peacekeeper. Yes. Anything goes down, I'm gonna go quiet. I'm gonna sit there and process it because I wanna understand my involvement in it. Was it me? Was it us? How can I have done that differently? So I sit there and I wanna understand what happened and why it happened. So I go quiet. In the meantime, he wants to know what's going on. So keep the peace, let me have my time, and then we can come and deal with it. 
So those two dynamics works when it works, but when it doesn't work, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, so much so, we, we, we start having some intense fellowship. <laughs> And uh, we decided, with tears, sitting on our couch, with tears, both of us crying, uh, because we realized we couldn't keep doing this and feeling as though we're not making any progress, because we're, it almost seems like we're fighting about the same thing, I'm sorry, having an intense fellowship <laughs> about the same thing over and over, um, so, we came up with the brilliant idea of drawing down our agreement as to how we're going to handle our disagreements. That's good, that's good. So, we both came up with them, we typed them out, we went through it, and that in itself was therapeutic in both of us coming up with this, this thing that we're going to, this agreement that we're going to uh, adhere to. And we typed it up, put it on our vision board, because that's who we are, because we look at our vision board every day. And whenever there is an issue between of us, if either one of us are not adhering to the agreement that we both set up, we immediately go back to that piece of paper and say, wait, wait a minute. This is what we, we decided how we're going to handle this. You know why it's so important? He keeps saying we, the agreement that we created. Oftentimes, we try to tell people what we want them to do without getting their buy-in. But if you get their buy-in on it, then you can hold them accountable to what they agree to. And that's what's so beautiful about these words that you're choosing because you're saying, hey, we're going to go back to the vision. Another key point that you made is that y'all have a vision for your marriage. You know, we could, you'd sign up to companies or uh, work for companies, and the first thing they teach you is the vision for the company, their mission statement. But in our marriages, we don't have marriage mission statements. Yeah, we don't have visions for our marriage. Yeah. And we just coexist with each other, and then when we, quote, unquote, grow apart. And we get divorced because of irreconcilable differences. Say that, say you know, that. and yeah. it's like, well, how did y'all exist with each other for 10 and 15? And I've heard couples who have DM'd me that have gone through divorces after 30 years of marriage. And I'm going, you've been married for 30 years and decided I ain't about to do another year with you. <laughs> then what happened? How did y'all get so far apart in 30 years that you said it's better to live without you than to do another day with you? That's because something wasn't cultivated in that 30 yeah, years to become, become lasting. And so I love what you're saying right here. Keep, keep unpacking, King. So you said that um, y'all created vision. You actually have agreed upon strategy of how to resolve conflict. What are some of those key points that y'all had on resolving conflict? Well, the very first one, uh, my memory serves me right on the top of the list, was... Um, give one another time. Uh, but also, and this may sound uh, like an oxymoron, but give each other time to respond, but understand that even that time has a limit. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense, because some people play the waiting game, like give me time, be like, <laughs> 10 days later. You're like, I was going to say, that silence good goes Lord. on and You're on like, and on. Long? And then that's how it becomes unresolved issues, irreconcilable differences. Because you never came back and came back and said, so what y'all do is you say, hey, give me two hours, give me five hours, give me 24 hours. Y'all give agreed upon time. It depends on what it's about. <laughs> so, and if I'm ready. So, but, so tell so, me that. So, so, you know, to our point, we have the agreements. Not, they don't always work, but we have them because they, um, we have something to rely on. So depending on the situation, um, as he says, intense fellowships, and he gets passionate when he speaks. And I sit there and I'm like, lower your voice. I need to hear you so I can listen. And he's like, I just want to resolve this. I just want to resolve that. And I'm like, lower your voice because my upbringing, my parents are quiet and calm. And so that's my demeanor. And when you raise your voice, I'm going to shut down. So You know, that's so good because I talk loud, too. I get passionate. And I'm learning like to, to 
compromise with whoever I'm in love with is because, like you said, your upbringing, you come from a home where they're real quiet and just a, anybody said, hey, listen, you're hollering at me. Be like, I wasn't hollering at you. I'm just, you know, so then you're, 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 and then when you tell him he's hollering, then he's like, I'm not hollering. You're like, but you are. And he says, but I'm not hollering. And then he starts hollering. <laughs> And then that just creates an even bigger problem. You know what and I'm saying? And I do raise my voice. I'm like, maybe I do need to show back at him, you know, but that's not, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm like, okay, stop. So, let me just interject real quick. Don't lose your train of thought. I'm going back to something that Tony said in regards to our upbringing. It has an indelible impact on us. And sometimes we don't even realize. Sometimes we do things. We don't even know why that we do them. Only come to find out when we look back in the real attacks of our lives and we look at our families and the way we were raised, what we saw, even the things that were, wasn't said but was modeled, we, we inherently repeat that. And I was born, brought up in a large family, mainly ladies, uh, and none of them were quiet. And uh, I, you, you had to fight <laughs> to be heard and so forth in a, in, in a, in a, in a good way. But I would, it was loud. It was always loud in the house. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, as when she's talking about that, you know, lower your voice, it's because I was naturally loud. Yeah. Um, we're about to get ready to wrap up this first. Uh, gosh, I love talking to y'all. Are y'all finding value in this? Isn't this amazing? <laughs> My last question, my last question with y'all, and I want to just go around straight from you, Lloyd, all the way around. What has become the greatest, let me ask you this, what have you learned most about yourself in marriage? I think, I think I've learned that I'm stronger than I thought I am. Or, did I say that right? Yeah. I'm stronger than I thought or think I, I, I thought I was. Um, and in the sense of, you know, in your mind, in your perfect image of what a marriage is and everybody goes into it the first day thinking it's just gonna be, you know, bed of roses and it's gonna be so amazing in every single aspect and it's just not true. It's just not. <laughs> Ever, in anybody's she marriage. Said, oh, 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 right? oh. <laughs> but it's still lovely. <laughs> but, <laughs> He took you to Paris, but, he took you to but, Paris, stay Yes, there. exactly. No, but what I mean is, it's like, you, I've learned that, you know, <laughs> I've learned that in giving my wife grace, I also had to learn to give myself grace, and recognize that, my mother always said, had, she would say, this too shall pass. She yes. would always say that to me from the time I was a child. And I kind of began to internalize that, and that was kind of something that I've taken into how we deal or how we walk into any, any situation, you know. We're going to get through it. We're going to make it. I believe that we're going we're gonna to overcome, so. That's good. Great recovery. <laughs> <laughs> he said, long drive back home is what he said. <laughs> you ain't going up the road. <laughs> we said do not. This man was talking about get him some cassava bread. I said, I said that's some uh, uh, bohemian, uh, I mean, I, I mean B Bermudian uh, cornbread. That's what I said. Bermudian cornbread. <laughs> he meant cassava pie. Can you repeat the question, please? The question was, what did marriage teach you about yourself? Uh, mine is, is twofold. Um, I was a selfish individual and that is because I had to take care of myself from a very early age. Makes sense. But I didn't know that it was going to manifest in the ways that it did um, as an adult. And so together with my husband, we have broken that and the character development um, was you know, embarked upon, and I am in a much different space. So I'm grateful for that. Also, that I have the capacity to love in a larger way than I thought I could. 
because it doesn't, given attention to my husband and my children, my family, my passions, my businesses, it's not about which one I love more, but it's about how I show up for each of them. And our capacity to love in that regard, it changes over time. And you know, I believe that I am now in a space where I am making the right choices that will allow me to show up in a way that is quality and present for the different buckets in my life. That's good. Lord, that was good. Sister Swan. <laughs> Sister Swan, tell me what has marriage taught you about yourself? What I'm going to answer in, I am grateful that I recognize that I am married. As I stated, I was good with the flu, didn't know if I would, could, didn't matter to me. And I actually say it to him often, I'm so glad that you selected me. And I also say to him, I don't, I'm so glad that I'm married and I don't know where I would be today if I was still single. So what I've learned about myself is, I think I do want to be married after all. I just didn't know it. <laughs> good, good. And take some of your words, I think I found my purpose partner. Good, good. We live on purpose. Good. What's up? <laughs> Say, what's up? <laughs> Dr. Swan, what did Maris teach you about yourself, Mr. Fixer? <laughs> So, and I'm his number last. <laughs> number last. Number last. There it is. So yes, this, this time around, having done the, the, the work, what I've learned um, is that Francia balances me. Um, I, I don't always have to be um, Superman. I, it's okay for me to be Clark Kent. Yeah. I, I, I had to recognize which one was required at the appointed time and for the appropriate purpose, yeah. for the appointed reason. There were times she didn't need me to be Superman. She just wanted me to be Clark Kent. Yeah. And I had to learn, and she brought those things out of me and put them in the sequential order that it should be so that we could not just live, but we could thrive. Yeah. 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 Did this bless y'all as much as it blessed me? Y'all give it up for this amazing panel. Y'all showed up. See, they were nervous at first. They was like, man, we about to do this podcast. It was painless, wasn't it? See? Yeah, it was. See? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My boy Lord recovered a couple of times. Yeah, I think you're in good standing. Uh, we're going to pray. I think y'all need a breakthrough on this whole proposal thing. We're going to have to go ahead and do a whole nother proposal. Yeah, we got to do something. We got to do something at a vow renewal or something. You got to do something. You got to step up, brother. We got to do something, Dr. Swan. Do something. But listen, thank y'all so much. Y'all are a great audience. We're going to take a, uh, we're about to do a raffle, right? About to do a raffle, and then we'll be back with the singles panel. So thank y'all so much. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit, live intentionally and transparently, and don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.